Good evening and welcome to this episode of Chew the Could. I'm John Houston, Director of Business Services for Protrition Feed. I'm glad to have such a well-rounded group of guests with me this evening. Let me introduce to you Mr. Mark Powell. Mark, uh, his day job is with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, but Mark, as far as back as I can remember, and even further back than you can remember, your family has been in the sheep business and, and certainly uh, continue to operate such a a uh, well-ran operation uh, over in Wilson County. So we're glad to have you here. Thank you very much. Also, Dr. Kevin Cox. Dr. Cox is the Chief Operating Officer uh, for Alliance Animal Care, as well as being a practicing veterinarian. And so uh, he was telling me just earlier today that he's been uh, associated with the co-op for 18 years. It was hard to believe uh, when you told me that, uh, Dr. Cox, but thank you for uh, being with us. Also, we have Josh Norman. Uh, Josh uh, operates and owns a Hidden River uh, farm over uh, in the Thompson Station area. Uh, but in his day job, he is an ag teacher at uh, Spring Hill High School. So uh, really glad to have this expertise with us this evening. So we'll get right into it and ask a few questions. So uh, Mark, uh, from a sheep standpoint, you know, we the hair breeds have come on strong here in the last few years, but uh, also, you know, with the wool breeds, uh, uh, how do you uh, manage heat stress in the, in the this time of the year? We're filming here the first week of June, and it's just going to get hotter. So ha what kinds of things do you try to do uh, on your operation from a heat stress standpoint? We, we raise all of our sheep have wool, so uh, obviously shearing is a big, uh, big job at our, our farm, and we try and, and get that done as early as possible, but not too early. You know, in, in Tennessee, we've got some uh, chilly nights, uh, even in April and sometimes in May. So I, I generally don't shear uh, before April, but sometime in May, we get the entire sheep flock uh, sheared off, uh, completely slicked off, and that that certainly takes care of them for the for the uh, summer and and the fall. Uh, and that's a that's one of the major reasons you have heat stress in in, the, in our sheep anyway. Uh, providing uh, obviously plenty of uh, good clean water uh, at all times for for the sheep is important and then uh, all of our sheep graze uh, well they graze year-round mostly but uh, in the summer they're all outside but we have to provide uh, plenty of shade whether that's a, a shelter or uh, all of we our farm is divided up into 15 different uh, paddocks so each each one of those has a either a shade or a, uh, a tree line in it where they can get under and stay cool uh, if we get in a, a serious situation uh, uh, and we don't have time to shear the entire flock, but if you've got one that's down, uh, we generally make sure at least their bellies are, are sheared because that's where they, they emit a lot of their heat just from their belly. But uh, that's some of the things we do at Linwood Farm. Re really good information. So, uh, Josh, from a goat perspective, uh, and in particular, you know, in the, in the summertime and going to shows maybe or fairs later in the, you know, from, you know, really from July in Tennessee all the way through the fall, yes, uh, how, how would you uh, manage uh, uh, heat stress? So with us, it's kind of twofold because we have the brood does, but then we also have the show stock. So like Mr. Powell was saying, clean, cool water is, is essential. Um, luckily, we don't have to worry about shearing or anything like that. We run commercial and registered boar goats, so they were originally adapted South Africa, so they, they're very heat tolerant. Um, but water is, is key with any livestock, especially come summer. We don't have automatic waters. We're still watering out of troughs, but we'll dump them every two or three days just to put cool, clean water in it. Um, the does on pasture... Uh, like Mr. Powell was saying, they've got some type of shade, either a, a run-in or a tree line where they can get into the shade and everything stay cool. Uh, I know some people have gone so far in the real hot summers to uh, to put sprinkler systems or misters up into the uh, run-ins and everything just to try to help cool the ground so that when they're laying down, they're dissipating heat as well. Um, on the flip side of that with our show stock, it's hair. I mean, we're growing as much hair, working hair and everything. So actually in our barn, we've probably got between six and nine fans running at all times. Uh, the show goats, we're changing water twice a day. Um, we're adding in some type of electrolyte just to keep them drinking and everything. Uh, but just keeping them cool. There's different products, feed through products that you can use to, uh, to help regulate body temperature and everything else. But 
keeping them cool, especially when they've got an inch, inch and a half of hair, and it's that thick hair, um, regulating that body temperature and just keeping them comfortable. Really good. Well, thank you very much. Let's shift gears just a little bit. Uh, Dr. Cox, I'll address this question to you from, from a general health standpoint. When we think about vaccines and we think about, uh, you know, we, we, we have uh, uh, breeding stock and then we have uh, babies coming along, you know, as well. Just general health recommendations. Uh, what, what would you uh, recommend that we if we don't do anything else, do this. Okay. Well, that's an excellent question. You know, in the small ruminant world, we're challenged just a little bit uh, in that there aren't many vaccines that are labeled for, for sheep and goats. And so we, we do have to meet that challenge, but by far the number one thing that is an absolute must is to vaccinate for the clostridial diseases, specifically clostridium perfringens type C and D and tetanus. And so thankfully, there is a vaccine that's labeled for small ruminants for those diseases, and that's called Barvac CDT. And we encourage everyone, no matter whether it's broodstock or showstock, to vaccinate all small ruminants with, with that vaccine. We encourage people that have broodstock to, to vaccinate about a month before uh, lambing or kidding in order to put good cholesterol immunity into that milk. Um, so we want to make antibodies and put it in the milk and pass it on to those babies as quickly as we can get it. Um, if we can't get that done, then we'll think about vaccinating um, the, the lambs or the kids with that vaccine very early on in life. So as early as two to three weeks of age, which is probably a little earlier than we would normally recommend, but if their moms have not been vaccinated, we would go ahead and do that. If the mothers have been vaccinated, then we might wait till about four to six weeks to vaccinate with, with a that specific vaccine, Barvac CDT. Um, in terms of other vaccines, uh, certainly with the, the goats, we worry just a little bit more about leptospirosis and lepto um, abortion. Um, there's not a vaccine specifically labeled for goat um, lepto, but we do have the cattle vaccines. And uh, if you have a relationship with your veterinarian and you talk to your veterinarian, he can recommend that you use that vaccine off label and use it in your small ruminants. We worry just a little bit less about lepto um, uh, in, in the sheep, but those are the two things that we would for sure talk about in terms of vaccines. Um, so the, the clostridium diseases, perfringens, top T and D, tetanus, and then lepto. So let me follow up with a question. Uh, as you mentioned vaccines, um, we hear the term overeating disease and rotoxemia. Um, Talk to us a little bit about what that is um, and does it have a lot to do with overeating? And yeah, that's, that's an interesting name for, for that specific disease and, and it's kind of a, uh, an unfortunate name in my opinion because it really doesn't specifically uh, come from the, the lambs overeating um, or the kids. Um, but um, it is um, the, the common term or the lay term for the clostridial diseases caused by perfringens, so clostridium perfringens type C and D. And um, we can have um, some nutritional upset disturbances, if you will, uh, that can cause uh, bacteria to die off in the, in the intestines. And when those bacteria die off, they release uh, an endotoxin, and that's where we get the enterotoxemia. So um, while people may think that it's actually eating too much, it, it, it could be related to eating too little, for instance, uh, if uh, it causes a bacterial disturbance that causes that bacteria to die off. Uh, so we don't want to overfeed, but we don't want to underfeed either. Okay. So let me uh, change gears just a little bit. And, and Josh, I'll, I'll address the first question to you when it comes to uh, kidding. And, uh, you know, so, so uh, your hope, I'm sure, is to have twins. Yes. So, yeah. uh, but what if there's triplets? How do you handle the the triplets, and uh, uh, then I'll follow up with uh, with uh, uh, Mark about uh, the sheep. But how do, how would you handle uh, triplets on a on a doe? So triplets on a doe, we sort of do it a case by case basis. Normally, if the doe seems to be producing enough, the doe's milk is the best for the kid. 
they're not always able to raise three. Typically what we will do, if it doesn't look like she's gonna be able to, we will either pull that kid and try to graft it onto another doe that had a single, or we're just gonna be up late nights and everything bottle feeding. Um, something we actually did in the last two years was purchase one of the automatic milk machines. Um, so we're able to put the milk powder in. It has a, a heating element to it and everything. So there's always constant warm milk as a nurse. It trips a sensor and augers in the correct amount of weighted powder and water and mixes it so that they always have access to it. Um, but a lot of the times we end up pulling the kids. Luckily, where I'm a, a school teacher, they tend to go to school with me and uh, <laughs> the kids get to bottle raise them. And uh, we've done that the last two years when we've had triplets and the, the students really enjoy doing it. Well, I never that. thought about that. I'll bring you a load. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, so uh, just following up, Mark, uh, when, you, when you do have to uh, bottle feed, how, how do you go about that? Do you, do you uh, leave those lambs with everything else? Do you separate them? Are you bottle feeding uh, with actual bottles? Do you use buckets? How do you do that? So. We, it depends on the number that we have. If we just have a, a couple, uh, which we hope is the case, we'll just fix individual bottles. Um, if there's several and, and we're having to feed them quite frequently, we've, we've got a, a lamb bar, I guess you call it. It's a bucket with several teats on the bottom and you can just pour the milk in there. And, and that's a little better because they can nurse or get the milk uh, uh, around the clock. Uh, you, we put a uh, milk jug in there full of wa uh, ice water and uh, keep it cool uh, so it doesn't spoil. But uh, that seems to work for us to, to, uh, to use that lamb bar if you've got quite a few. And uh, generally we will keep them in a separate lambing pen or separate area just to themselves and try and get them off within a month uh, so we we uh, bottle feed them uh, and and then within a week we'll have creep feed in there and hopefully they'll start eating that and then after a month wean them off to the to the uh, creep feed excellent excellent so uh another health question dr cox you know i know uh, a lot of people deal with uh with this thing we call bloody scours or coccidiosis and and uh, in particular in these commercial uh, commercial operations for sure. And so, so how, how would you recommend that we, I guess, identify that and then how would we treat that? Yeah, coccidiosis is a terrible problem um, for all ruminant species, but specifically in small ruminants, we, that's a challenge for us. Um, so identifying it uh, can be even uh, a challenge. Most of the time we can notice that if an animal's having uh, diarrhea that's either either bloody or just really really loose uh, we can suspect it and some places and in some farms they'll go ahead and start treating empirically just assuming that they have some coccidiosis um, taking a stool sample to a veterinary clinic uh, having a, a veterinarian or a technician run that stool sample and look for the coccidia oocytes or the little eggs uh, can certainly confirm that and well, that's generally probably uh, the ideal way to do it. But treating for that um, is not um, treating empirically is not a bad idea, especially until you get your diagnosis. So in terms of treating, there's a couple of options. Um, certainly uh, treating in the water is a, is a great option. Um, there's a drug called Amprolium that comes in a brand name product called Corid um, that seems to work really well in terms of uh, treating active cases and in some places uh, that's even used as a preventive to try to keep uh, coccidiosis from getting started. And certainly there are um, feed-through options for coccidiostats that um, have certain feeds will have uh, either meninsin or lasalicid or something like that in it that will help control um, coccidiosis in the commercial operations, um, uh, stalker type operations if you will. Okay, real good. So uh, if we think about uh, uh, these, this coccidia, and I, and I wanted to ask just a, a follow-up about uh, antibiotics and, and if you, you know, and I guess it matters to everybody in the livestock business, but what is coming down the road with antibiotics and how important it is to be aligned with a, with a local veterinarian. Well, as a veterinarian, I think it's extremely important that you have a great relationship with your veterinarian um, for a number of reasons. But 
uh, in the future, it's going to become uh, imperative. Uh, in sometime late 2023, all current over-the-counter antibiotics will transition to RX antibiotics and will only be available from uh, places that uh, can provide script products. And so you uh, will need a relationship with a veterinarian that can write a script. And so as, as we move forward, um, the ability to, to access antibiotics, um, and we've talked about the use of antibiotics for several different things. We've talked about it for foot rot or foot scald, uh, for preventing certain types of abortions or treating pneumonia or whatever the case. Um, all of those are going to uh, require that relationship with um, your veterinarian to be uh, in place so that he can he or she can write you a script for those antibiotics. So, uh, Mark, let me ask you. I know I know from your farm standpoint, uh, you also uh, sell some uh, some meat products off the farm, and and uh, so tell me just a little bit about the clientele and how you uh, do. Do you, do you have target markets you're looking at there and we we started uh, about well last fall uh, with uh, a farmers market in Las Casas, uh, first time ever selling retail cuts uh, to the public, and uh, it, it was a slow process getting started because number one not not a lot of people know about lamb, but if you, we found if you can get them to eat it one time, uh, they will uh, they'll come back, and we're seeing a lot of repeat customers already. Uh, one of the things we did instead of offering 15 or 20 different cuts we just offer four uh, that way we can keep keep the freezers stocked uh, but our, our clientele is uh, is growing we're, we're introducing lamb so it's it's fairly small and uh, we're seeing over time more and more people are are uh, trying it out Really good. So uh, as we kind of wrap this uh, episode up, uh, uh, Josh, I wanted to follow up with just a, a, a question from the, from the goat standpoint. Um, when, when you wean your kids, uh, what process do you go through to, uh, to wean? So <clears throat> with weaning, we have, like we've talked about, the commercial and the registered side. Um, on the commercial side, we usually wait about 60 days um, that's ideal before we start weaning on the registered side we almost let the kids just wean themselves and let the does wean them off um, they just they look better they perform better they're just overall healthier looking um, the longer they're able to stay on the dams but pretty much what we'll do is just uh, we honestly, we're, we're kind of old school. We'll still wean by the signs and everything. Um, I've actually done it the last couple of years if not, and then doing one group with and one group without. And it it's old wives tales, but there must be something to it if it's still followed around that long. But pretty much what we'll do is we'll separate them and uh, separate them where they're not able to see their dams. And that helps a lot with the, uh, the weaning stress, but stressing them as little stress as we can and weaning is usually going to be the best thing we can do. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. And Josh, I appreciate your time today for this, this segment of Chew the Cud and Dr. Cox and, and Mark, thank you so much for being here and, and certainly appreciate all the expertise that you've shared. Uh, for any questions or uh, uh, concerns or products or comments, uh, please check with your local farmers co-op. Thank you.